biology student, uh, graduate student in uh, the biology department. Uh, it is my honor to introduce a really cool person. Um, Jeffrey um, Esparza has um, graduated from CSUN in 2016 with a bachelor's in ecology and evolution and went on to do some uh, tropical research as well as work for various uh, nonprofit zoos such as the LA Zoo. And Jeffrey came back to CSUN to do their master's degree, uh, which they defended this year. Um, congratulations for that. Um, and their project is really cool. And today that's what we're gonna be focusing on as our Earth, uh, Earth Month theme. So Jeffrey's master's research focused on coexistence between the nine banded armadillo and the six banded armadillo, armadillo uh, in the Southern Pantanal of Brazil. His research combines substrate and habitat sampling with remote camera trapping in an effort to understand how these two similar species were partitioning their niche. So today uh, we're gonna be talking about that and Jeffrey, I'll let you go ahead. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you everyone um, for joining me today. Uh, just like Richard said, I'm here to talk about the research that I've been conducting for the past few years here at CSUN. So today it's all about a tale of two armadillos. Uh, now, before I get started, I thought I would also uh, introduce myself because Richard did such a wonderful job and I wanna also just add on a few pictures. So uh, just like Richard said, I um, received my bachelor's degree here at CSUN. Um, so for, before being a graduate student, I was an undergraduate student and uh, that's where I got all of my field experience through CSUN. So uh, this is me in 2015. Um, that was my first ever uh, exposure to field biology. I actually assisted another graduate student uh, with their master's research. So I went to the um, Ecuadorian Amazon and I was there for a little over a month. So my very first exposure to field biology was a month deep in the rainforest and it was hot, it was sweaty, it was lots of bugs and I fell in love with it. I couldn't stop thinking of it. And thankfully uh, I was able to go again in 2016. So in 2016, I was part of the CSUN tropical biology semester where I went back to Ecuador for a couple of months where I then uh, conducted my own research. You know, I thought of my own questions and I performed research. So uh, I've really been inspired through CSUN through the Department of Biology. And I was very fortunate to connect with so many awesome faculty and students, and it really helped me uh, become the biologist I am today. So after I graduated with my bachelor's, I was teaching about conservation and wildlife before I had the itch to go back to the field and conduct more research. And that is what happened uh, when I did my research for my master's thesis. So I was able to go to Brazil and conduct my very own graduate study. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I won't spoil it too early on. Um, and the way this talk is going to be focused on, it's, it's going to be similar to my thesis defense. So if you've never been to one of those or unfamiliar, pretty much the style of this sort of talk is I want to dive into the background, talk a little bit about coexistence, which is the main theme of this talk. Uh, armadillos, of course, my study species and the location I did it at, the Pantanal wetlands. Once we get familiarize ourselves with the, the background, then we can get into the study design, the questions I had, um, the study site, the methods I used to address those questions and the results I received in turn. And then finally, once we uh, discuss all of that, then we can think bigger, you know, think of the, the bigger picture, you know, what does it all mean? Why do we care? Why is it so important? And more importantly, what can we do moving forward? So you always wanna think of the big picture. And that is essentially what this talk is going to be on today. But the first thing I want to discuss is coexistence, okay? And really another word for coexistence is competition. Understanding competition and competitive interactions uh, among and between species is very important and understanding the factors that can lead to extinction. See, the more species extinct, I'm sorry, the more species compete, the more likely they are to become extinct. Um, but despite that, we know that uh, there's a lot of diversity in the world. And that is due to something known as the ecological niche. So typically species, in order to reduce competition, will specialize in certain niches. And now the thing with the niche is that the more overlap there is in a certain niche or the more you know, similar species are, the less likely they are to coexist. But we all know that that's not usually the case 
because of the diversity of life. There's lots of different species all over the world. And one way we can, we can think of how this is possible is through something known as niche partitioning. So the way species partition resources as a method of reducing competition. When you reduce competition, you promote coexistence. So niche partitioning is very common in the literature. It's a very common study. Typically, when you're looking at niche partitioning, you want to look at the niche, the ecological niche, and more importantly, you want to look at the dimensions of the niche. So when, when doing, when conducting studies on niche partitioning, a few niche dimensions uh, usually come into play. Uh, some of those being food, so the food dimension, space and habitat dimension, and time, the temporal dimension. So these are three pretty common dimensions in terms of niche partitioning. And uh, just to expand on them a little bit further, I wanna go one by one. So in terms of food, the food dimension, we have dietary niche partitioning. So this is you know, reducing your dietary overlap by consuming different foods. So a pretty good example of this is with these uh, monkeys down in the, uh, in the tropics in Central and South America. So if you go to certain rainforests in South America, there's all these different species of monkey coexisting living in, in the treetops. But when you look at what they're eating, you can see that they're partitioning their niche via their food intake with some of the smaller monkeys eating insects or tree sap, lots of you know, high sugar foods, whereas some of the larger bodied monkeys are consuming lots of fruits and foliage. So that is dietary niche partitioning. Then we have space and habitat use with a pretty common example being these anoles found in the Caribbean. So here you have all these different species of lizard and you see they're all seemingly coexisting on the same tree and you think, okay, well, how is that niche partitioning? But again, if you get your magnifying glass and look a little bit closer, you'll see that they're partitioning where exactly they're living at on the tree with some of them being at the top of the tree or at the tips of the branches or at the base of the trunk, et cetera. So space and habitat is being partitioned and thus it's promoting the coexistence among these different lizards. And then we have another axis, the time. So the, the time dimension. So reducing your overlap uh, by shifting your behavioral patterns. So a very good example with uh, temporal niche partitioning is with these big cats. Again, found in the Americas, we have the two largest cats, the jaguar and the puma. And very often when they're found in the same forest in South America, you'll notice the behavioral shifts in their activity. In some instances, the jaguar being more diurnal and the puma being more nocturnal or vice versa, just depending on where you go. So those are some three examples of niche partitioning among those three different dimensions. And in terms of the studies, these are very common. They're, they're uh, common studies on mammals. Uh, specifically carnivores such as big cats. You know, you can find lots of niche partitioning studies on big cats, uh, but they're not as common on these animals, the armadillos. And this is uh, the species that I chose to work with for my research. So before I explain the armadillo, I want to think a little bit bigger about their evolutionary history. So armadillos are really cool because they come from this unique group of mammals known as anarthrins. So within this super order, of strange jointed mammals, there's two orders. There are your cingulates or your armadillos. They're known for their bony carapace and their uh, fossorial or digging habits. And then uh, just next to them are the pylosins. So the hairier anteaters and sloths. So if you didn't know, this is a pretty unique family, uh, family tree. And as much as I was just telling uh, Richard, as much as I like the sloths and the anteaters, you know, hopefully I can give you all a talk on them someday. Today is all about the cingulates. Today is all about the armadillos. Now, when I say armadillo, almost always we tend to think of the one species, you know, the long nose and the, the big ears, you know, analogous to Texas or the Southern United States. And that's great, but what we don't tend to think of are all the other species of armadillo. And armadillos are incredibly diverse with over 20 species. And I mean, if, if you just look at this graphic, you, you'll see they, they really do come in all shapes and sizes uh, with one species uh, that fits in the palm of your hand and another species that can be over 30 kilograms with a giant armadillo. So here we have this incredible diversity of mammals. Uh, but despite that, again, we always think of the one. So what is so unique about this particular species well, it's definitely going to be geography because this is the most widely distributed species of armadillo. So the nine-banded armadillo can be found in the Southern United States all the way down to uh, Argentina as well. 
if you go to Central America, you're going to find another species of armadillo, but really the bulk of the diversity is found in South America. So all the 20 other species are found in South America and they're found in a wide, array, uh, wide um, array of habitats. They're found in the, the grasslands and in the tropical forest and in the tropical wetlands, the latter of which I was particularly interested in. So in terms of the wetlands of South America, there's one in particular that I like, the world's largest tropical wetland. So this is the Pantanal, found predominantly in the country of Brazil, but you can see it also stretches into Bolivia and even into Paraguay as well. Now, when I say tropical wetland, I want you to visualize what I'm talking about. So here's a beautiful picture of the landscape. And the reason why the Pantanal is so cool is because it's a, a mosaic of different ecosystems. So, you know, you have your tropical forests, and then you have open grasslands, and then, of course, all these marshes and rivers and lakes. So it's, it's very beautiful. And it is actually a seasonal floodplain. So depending on the time of year you go, you're going to be treated with a different landscape. So if you go in April, like I did in this picture, it's going to be sort of on the tail end of the rainy season. So it's still going to be pretty wet, uh, lots of mosquitoes out there. But if you fast forward a few months and, and go in July, you're going to see a completely different landscape. So uh, the rainy season, the dry season, they're completely different and it can really influence the wildlife and the, the plant life in the area. So just to, again, to put it in perspective, what was once a walking pathway for an animal such as this taper can slowly but surely turn into a flooded canal over time. So really the influence of the weather and the Pantanal is very important. Okay, that's why it's known as a seasonal uh, wetland. Now, in terms of the wildlife, this place is, is booming with wildlife. So I've been very fortunate to go to some pretty exciting places uh, during, my, during my research experience and nothing quite hit like it did with the Pantanal in terms of, you know, all the different birds I would see and the reptiles, amphibians, insects. And of course, because I'm a mammologist, I like to see mammals, which are usually pretty difficult to spot, but here in the Pantanal, they're just bursting everywhere I go, everywhere I would look, I would find more and more, uh, just like all these pictures are showing. And as much as I would like to discuss all of the different mammals, today's all about the lesser known mammals, okay, that I chose to work with for my research. So today's all about the armadillos. Now at my study site, there are these two species of armadillo. There's a six-banded armadillo, which you can see on the left, and then there's the nine-banded armadillo, which you can see on the right. So here I have these two species, roughly similar in size and weight, and it leads to the, the overall question I had. So how are these two species partitioning their niche? Remember we talked about earlier, so what is going on between these two species? So in order to address this question, first I actually had to go down into the field. So I went to uh, my field site, Fazenda San Francisco Cattle Wildlife Ranch, and I was here for two months uh, in the summer of 2019. So from July through August, and that was predominantly during the dry season. Now, just to orient you on the geography of the ranch, here you can see this red line. So this is actually the main highway, BR-262. So this is like a big geographic barrier. So you come from the highway, then you enter the ranch, and then this area is all deformed pastures and just left of this are all the irrigated rice fields and then everything in green everything you see in green is native Pantanal okay so this is all native tropical forest areas and what's interesting about this ranch is you can see here in the foreign pastures you have all these green spots that look pretty small but I promise you are very very big in person so dispersed among the foreign pastures are all these native forest patches so it leads to this you know great study site where you can study uh, wildlife interactions uh, in and around the ranch and sometimes a completely transformed landscape. So a very cool place to conduct research and I was very fortunate to, to go there a few years ago. Now the niche dimensions of interest. So this is what I uh, proposed to study for my master's thesis. So I, I was interested in a few different niche dimensions. One of those being substrate preference. So like the earth, if you will, because armadillos are fossorial, you know, they're all very uh, proficient diggers. I was interested in, in the substrate that they're preferentially burrowing in. Uh, maybe there's some connection in, in the niche depending on where they're burrowing. And then there was also the time. Remember time 
is pretty common in these studies. So I was wondering maybe if the two species are partitioning their niche by shifting their activity patterns to avoid one another. So these were the, the two niche dimensions I proposed to look at for this master's research. And we're gonna discuss them one by one. So the first one we're gonna discuss is going to be the substrate. So substrate preference. So are armadillos preferring different substrate? And the way I did this was I wanted to first find burrows, take certain measurements on those burrows, and then actually look at the substrate of each burrow. So lots of different measurements were going to go down. So when I was in the field, I would look for burrows. And once I found them, I would take the following measurements. I would measure the height and the width and the depth, as well as the aspect of the entrance. And then I would take a measurement uh, of the distance to the nearest insect mound. These very large insect mounds are very common on the ranch. So I was wondering maybe if uh, the armadillos are preferentially burrowing around these potential food sources. And then I would also take into account the location. So as I mentioned, within those foreign pastures, there are all these different forest patches. Uh, so I was looking at burrows in these forests and I wanted to compare those to the, the landscape just outside the forest to see if there's a difference in the substrate quality or the, any sort of burrow dimension between the locations. Because as you can see, they're very different. So I, wanted, I was interested in the differences between those two. Once I got all of this data down, then I would start to actually measure the substrate itself. And the way I did this was by digging a hole next to each burrow at about 25 centimeters deep, extracting a kilogram of soil and running it through the set of sieves. The set of sieves would segregate the soil by size. And this way I can get a relative distribution of the size. So once I have all of these different variables, then I could visualize them by plotting them on a principal component analysis. So just a way to visualize my data and then test the significance uh, between the two locations by using a permanova. Now, the other part of my research that I wanted to conduct was actually on the morphology. I was interested if morphology or the anatomy of these animals is a good predictor in substrate preference. So the reason or the way I would do this would be by looking at the claws of the armadillos by measuring the largest claw and comparing it to the limb elements. So the forelimb and the hind limb. So the way you do this is actually by going to museums. Going, uh, there's a few museums in the United States that have uh, great collections, especially with armadillos. So the plan was to go to these places and measure the claws on uh, all the museum specimens. Now, the reason being is because although armadillos are all fossorial, all of them are diggers, they exhibit different degrees of fossoriality, uh, with some of them, as you can clearly see in this photo, having much bigger and stronger claws than other ones. So the idea I had was seeing if we can look at the anatomy of the animal just in a museum specimen and see if it correlates with the, the field data I gathered. Unfortunately, this required extensive travel and the plan was to do it in 2020, uh, but due to the pandemic you know, and all the closure of the museums, we ultimately had to Put this, put this part on pause. So it's just something to think of right now though, that morphologically speaking, these animals uh, exhibit some diversity and it would be interesting to look at it in the future. Uh, but that's for another time and another talk. Now, the main question though, we already went through the methods and it was on the substrate, are armadillos preferring different substrate? So now we're gonna look at the results of the, the first part of my thesis and the, the question I had. And when I went out, I got all this data, I went to the field, and I did not find a significant difference among the variables between a forested area and an open area. So here you can see the PCA explains minimal variation at 25%, with PC2 explaining even less at about 17%. And you can see the p-value is not significant. But if you're looking at this graph and just kind of squinting and going like, what's going on? It, it looks a mess because it is a mess. The data is very messy. Uh, so rather than trying to explain this graph, I think it's better if we go section by section and see what's going on. So in terms of the substrate itself through the sieves, uh, I looked at it between an open habitat and those forest patches, and you can see I did not find a difference in the big substrate and the small substrate. So green is forest and blue is open. No real difference across the substrate size. In terms of the distance to an insect mound, Again, you can see maybe a trend in the open, but no significant difference between the distance in a forest patch and an open patch. And here's the insect mount I was referring to. 
And then again, with the burrow dimensions, no real difference in the height, the width and the depth between the two locations. So uh, th this, is, this is what you get, you know, you go out into the field, do all this research, you try to address the question. And in this case, it didn't really get many answers. I actually started to get more questions. And part of it was a little confusing. For one thing, I, I was interested in the height and the width for a specific reason. Uh, even though it turned out there's no difference, as you can see here. But the reason I wanted to look at the height and width of each burrow is because although these armadillos are pretty similar in, in size and weight, uh, physically they're a little bit different, with the six-banded being a little bit more pancaked and flat, and the nine-banded being a bit more dome-shaped, right? So the idea was that you can identify who's digging the burrow based on those dimensions. And it's actually been done. It's in the literature that you can identify species, uh, at least at the genus level sometimes. So you can find out who's digging the burrow just based on the dimensions at the entrance. So when I didn't find a difference in the dimensions, I thought, okay, well, what's, what's going on here? You know, what's, which burrows are I'm actually looking at? The good thing is, is that along with doing all those measurements, I actually also placed camera traps in, in front of many of these burrows with the idea, or the, the hopeful thought that I would record who's digging the burrow or who's using the burrow uh, through cameras. Uh, but of course, much like a lot of things in science, uh, this also led to more questions than it did answers. So just to show you what I'm talking about, here is one specific camera trap. At 326 on July 8th in the afternoon, we have this six-banded armadillo, you can see it's uh, more flat shaped, was going into this burrow. And it, it was doing that for a few days. So I assumed this is the burrow that it, it was using. Now, a little over 30 minutes later at four o'clock in the afternoon on July 8th, same day, I had this nine banded armadillo. And again, you can see clearly it's a different species. And it actually went inside of this burrow that was already occupied before quickly jumping out and leaving. So now we have this sort of example of not so much competition, but more so facilitation between the species. And it leads to the question, who's digging the burrows? Are they being reused by other armadillos or sharing? I don't, probably not sharing, but maybe reusing. Like it's possible this nine banded armadillo saw what it was possibly a vacant burrow only to see what was occupied that made it retreat. Uh, if you're wondering if this was just a one-time occurrence, it wasn't. I actually recorded this behavior at this camera trap a few different times and at a few other camera traps across the field site. So this isn't a novel occurrence. It's something that was going on, uh, but that's all the data I have. I can only say definitively that, yeah, I saw it happen a few times. I don't have enough data to, to discuss anything else on it, but it's something to note and to think of going forward, you know, what's going on with these burrows and their importance uh, among the armadillos in the area. So that was one thing. Uh, the other thing you can do with cameras though is address other questions. So let's go back to the niche dimensions. So I discussed the substrate preference. We, we went out, we did our research, didn't really find much of a difference, but we did find some pretty unique behavior. And we set out to do something and we accomplished it. So with the substrate, we're a good check mark. Now I want to look at activity time though. So uh, the question here, the main question is, do armadillos temporally segregate? Okay, is there a shift in their activity between species? And the way we accomplish this is, or the way I accomplish this is by using camera traps. So camera traps are, are really common when looking at activity patterns with animals because they can give so much information on the animal in terms of its activity. So I had 16 camera traps uh, during my two month field season. Eight of those I put in a forested area and eight of those I put in open areas. And I was rotating them throughout the summer at different locations. So there's 16 stations on my behalf. And then I was also collaborating with a good friend of mine, Enrique, and he had over 60 camera traps across the field site. So uh, my cameras combined with his cameras create a very robust data set. And together, we're going to tackle this question on the activity patterns and segregation between these species. So the way we do this is we put all these cameras out. Uh, we're going to get all the photos, and they're going to be um, separated by hour intervals. And then I would use a test of significance to just to see if there's a difference. Is the nine-banded activity different from the six-banded activity? 
And then I would also use the overlap coefficient to pretty much see how different they are. So if there's a significant difference, we're interested in how different it is between species. So that was the idea we had for this moving forward. And with, with this data, I actually did find a significant difference in activity between the two species uh, with nine banded armadillos on the left being more nocturnal and six banded armadillos on the right being more diurnal. And here you can see the statistics, uh, it was significant. If you've never seen one of these graphs before, allow me to explain it, they're pretty easy to follow. So here's the number of records. So with 121 records of a nine banded against 120 records of a six banded, it's almost identical in terms of the occurrences we recorded. On the x-axis, you have time. So the graph starts at midnight, goes all the way to midday, and then it finishes at midnight as well. And then the density is on the y-axis. So how often you're recording the animal. So in terms of the nine banded, you can see we're taking lots of pictures of the nine banded just after midnight. And those pictures uh, really drop during the day. We're not really getting much activity at all during the day before picking up again in the evening. So that's why we say this is nocturnal. For the six banded, you can see the opposite. We're getting pictures throughout the day, but really the bulk of the pictures is set in, centered around midday. So that's why you see this peak here. Uh, I have another peak in the early evening, but then it dips again in the night. So there is a significant difference in activity between the two species. But remember, we wanted to use the overlap coefficient to measure how much of a difference. So how different are the activity patterns? So with this, uh, I found that there's minimal overlap between the species. So this coefficient is 0 0.4. A coefficient of one would be complete overlap or you know, identical activity patterns. And a coefficient of zero would be complete opposite activity patterns, both of which are pretty uncommon in the natural world. So you're gonna get something in between. Something at 0 0.4 is leaning more towards minimal overlap. And the way you see it on this graph is by looking at the shaded area. So the shaded area is all the overlap occurring between the species. And what we see here is that it's mostly occurring in the evening, specifically right here in the onset of the evening. So just to visualize it even better, I put these blue and yellow. Blue signifies the nighttime, yellow signifies the daytime. So during the evening, you see that there is gray, there's a little bit of overlap, and it really takes a dip in the morning and mostly in the day. There's a little bit of overlap in the late afternoon and most overlap occurs again on the onset of the evening. Uh, so that's it in terms of the overlap. We see it's minimal, but they are, there is some overlap occurring, which is, uh, I guess it would be expected to some degree. And that's it for both the niche dimensions. So we looked at the substrate, we got our answer. We looked at the activity time, we got our answer. But similar to the substrate, you know, when we had more questions, uh, same thing happens with the activity patterns. So now we know these species are segregating through time, but it leads to more questions like why? What is influencing their activity? Is it competition or is it an external pressure? So I, I did some more research, I was, I was looking into it, and one of the questions that often came up with my committee was predation. Do you think predators, the influence of outside predators influences their activity? And this is a good question. So one way to think of this is by looking at the large carnivores in the area, such as this jaguar uh, that I saw over summer. So here's a, just an excuse to show you the jaguar because it's such a cool video. But uh, do you think these large carnivores are influencing their activity? So uh, there are large carnivores on the ranch. You just saw the jaguars present on the ranch. The puma or the mountain lions also present on the ranch, as well as the maned wolf. So we have these large carnivores that coexist with these or you know live among these armadillos. Are they influencing their activity by uh, preying on them? So the thing is, I don't think so for a few different reasons. Uh, for one, Pumas and jaguars, while they prey on a wide variety of animals, they primarily choose medium to large bodied mammals. So capybaras, peccaries, deer, really big beefy mammals. Do they prey on armadillos? Yeah, absolutely, probably occasionally. But if you had to choose between you know, potato chips versus a big juicy capybara burger, they're gonna go for the capybara. So I don't think that it's, as much of a strong influence, more so that it is opportunistic. In terms of the main wolf right here, 
uh, they're actually more of a generalist. So meaning they're omnivorous. They eat things like fruits, plants, animals, uh, but most of their diet is actually mostly plants and fruit. So if you think of a little over 50% of the diet being plants and fruit, and then the other 48% being animals, then you have to dissect the animals they're eating. And they're eating opossums, rodents, rabbits, birds, snakes, lizards, insects, maybe armadillo here and there. So are they influencing the activity? Probably not. Again, I think for the large carnivores, it's probably more opportunistic than it is a really solid pressure. That's it for the big carnivores. But again, what about the smaller carnivores present on the ranch? Because they, they are very common, as you can see, here's an ocelot in this video that I, that I shot. And along with the ocelot, there's also the crab-eating fox. And these two uh, carnivores on the ranch are pretty common. So if you go to this location, you're probably gonna see them. And the same question, do you think maybe the smaller carnivores is influencing the activity of the armadillo? But again, similar to the large carnivores, I don't think it's likely for a few different reasons, uh, similar to the big ones. For one, ocelots specialize on small mammals. And when I say small mammals, I mean rodents and uh, marsupials, opossums, maybe rabbits, armadillos here and there, but really they're not the bulk of the, the ocelot's diet on the ranch. And the crab eating fox, similar to the main wolf as a generalist, but more of its diet is plants and fruits. And again, when you look at the animal matter it consumes, it's eating insects, crustaceans, snakes, birds, maybe armadillo here and there. Furthermore, armadillos are tough. They have that bony carapace. So actually preying on an armadillo is actually much more energy expensive. You know, it takes a lot of work to break into that carapace and, and what you get in return is minimal in terms of the energy received. Uh, so in terms of the small carnivores, I also think it's a bit more opportunistic rather than a, a very strong pressure. One more thing to note with all of these carnivores I mentioned, uh, their activity, most of them are all mostly nocturnal. Uh, but as we know with uh, the armadillos, they're active throughout the day. So um, just something to, to think of though, that these animals are more nocturnal. Okay, so we thought about the the predator, the outside predator. But what if we think of an armadillo as a predator? So does the diet or the prey of the armadillo influencing, is that influencing their activity? And this is a good question. So are they preferentially choosing different food and maybe that's why they're active at different times of day? And I'm not so sure, but I think it's possible. I think it's definitely possible that what the animals are eating is influencing their activity. Uh, this is what I wanted to look at for my thesis, but I didn't have enough time uh, to actually get the data for it. But by looking through the literature, there's a few things we can know. So both species primarily consume insects. So they're mostly eating insects together, uh, but there are differences in their diet. Six-banded armadillos have a much wider dietary niche breadth. So they're eating lots of different food. They're eating insects, they're eating spiders or millipedes, centipedes, plants, fruits, even vertebrates, such as snakes and lizards, uh, so they're, they're eating a wide variety of foods, uh, some of which, like the lizards and snakes, are diurnal. So it is possible that uh, that could be why they're active during the day, more so than the nine-banded armadillo, which is, in this area of the world, is much more specialized to eating insects, uh, specifically termites. So they're eating a wide uh, variety and high diversity of insects and termites in the area. So there is overlap in what they're eating, but there's also differences. So is what they're eating influencing their behavioral patterns during the day? It's possible. I don't have enough data or have any data to, to explain it, but it's something to think of moving forward. And again, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, in terms of niche dimensions of interest, diet and what animals eat is very, very good indicator of their uh, behavior. And it could help uh, illustrate what's going on in terms of niche partitioning between the species. So that's something to note and something to think of moving forward. Okay, so what can we do next? You know, we did all this data, um, it's a pretty cool project, I think, but what, what can we do moving forward? So this is a good question. And I already sort of explained some things we can do. I mean, one of the things I wanted to do was look at the anatomy or the ecomorphology and see how that uh, relates to their ecology in the wild. So that's what ecomorphology is. So. I think this is very promising research, and I think we can find out a lot about the animals and their way of life 
as well as the coexistence with other species just by looking at their ecomorphology. So I think this is a very good place to start. It's something that I already had the methods for, I just couldn't uh, flesh it out. And then there's also diet. Again, this is something I also proposed to do with my thesis. Uh, and I think, again, in terms of coexistence, this is very important. Looking at what the animals are eating can really paint a picture on the coexistence and what's going on uh, with the animals themselves. In terms of the location, I already mentioned the Pantanal is a seasonal floodplain. The landscape is going to be very different depending on the time of year you go. And most of my research actually took place in one season, dry season. So I think it, I think it would be interesting to look at it during the rainy season or even during the transitional periods and how their activity or behavior shifts throughout the year. It would be very different and probably much more difficult because conducting research in a wetland in the rainy season is very, 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 very difficult. Um, but it's, it's exciting and it's something to think of moving forward. And finally, I think probably the most important thing that I didn't look at for my research would be physiology. And the reason why is because xenarthrins, so armadillos, sloths, and anteaters, uh, they have very low metabolic rates. And the temperature and outside temperature really influences their behavior. And it sh it's supposed to be very important in terms of their activity. So if we really wanna know what's going on with these animals, I think it's very important that we look at the physiology to see what's really going on, what's really influencing them uh, to shift their activity. So if you really wanna paint the picture, I think you can't go anywhere, but the physiology is a definite next step. So that's what I hope to do. Uh, moving forward with this research one day. Okay, so finally, why do we care? So this is like, what's the big deal, right? A couple armadillos shift activity, share burrows, or don't really have differences in burrows. Like, what's the big deal? And uh, it's a good question if you're wondering that. Like, oh, cool, armadillos are kind of cool, but who cares, right? But for a few different reasons, this is important. For one, in terms of the temporal niche segregation, it's one thing to think of the, um, it's one thing to think of their activity patterns, but it's another thing to, to see it, right? It's another, another thing to actually go out and see what's going on. So that's what we do here with this. And furthermore, it really adds to the, the question, like what happens if you look at other species that share similar niche dimensions? Or what happens if we go to a different part of South America where there's even more species coexisting? Uh, another thing to look at is the diversity of armadillos. So I already mentioned this, but armadillos are very, very diverse. They're incredibly diverse. And here you can actually see it with uh, the different photos. So we have some species that are really built and strong, uh, really big claws. A couple species can fit and roll into a ball, uh, which if you're familiar with that, so that's a specific species. Some of them are almost completely subterranean, found almost always underground uh, in high elevation deserts or really hairy, found in tropical forests. So if you're thinking of armadillos and you're thinking of diversity, like I really wanna illustrate that they're very diverse, very diverse animals. And in some parts of South America, you can find two species coexisting. You can find four species coexisting, six, eight, depending on the, the part of South America you go, you can find a lot of armadillos. So I think that's really cool. And if you're wondering about coexistence, especially in mammals, I think armadillos are a great place to start. Uh, it could be tricky because they are a little bit difficult to find. Uh, and of course they're fossorial, so they're very good at digging, but I think it's very worth the investment because uh, not a lot is known on these animals and it can really do good for all sorts of animals by learning about them. And uh, that leads into the next point of my talk. So armadillos, you know, they dig burrows and just by digging a burrow, you might think like, okay, what's so important about that? But by digging a burrow, you're shifting the soil, you're mixing the soil, that's good for the earth. You're creating a, a little, you know, temperature controlled house, if you will, that armadillos can use and reuse. We know that other armadillos can use those burrows but other animals can use those burrows as well. And all sorts of animals like birds or other mammals, insects, arthropods. So armadillos themselves, they're considered ecosystem engineers because they actually transform the landscape. So 
just by existing in an ecosystem, they're really promoting biodiversity in their respective habitats. And that's what's important. And for me as a, you know, a biologist, ecologist, conservation biologist, this is what it's all about. I'm very interested in conservation. And the more we know about the armadillo, not only do we learn about them, we have this unique opportunity to learn about all sorts of wildlife in the area. And the more we do to protect the armadillo, the more that umbrella expands to all sorts of different animals. Uh, and even, even people in the area as well, just because armadillos, you know, exist and, and they're very important. So their existence, it, it can't go understated. And especially now in a time where deforestation is becoming accelerated and we're seeing forest fires go out of control and almost obliterate certain ecosystems, it's important. This is very important to think of in the future and, and moving forward as well. Uh, so I think the, that's why this research is so important and I hope that's why we can continue to conserve them and promote them as well. So with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you to everyone that helped with this project, specifically uh, my advisor, Dr. Fritz Hertel, my committee and my collaborator, all my collaborators, all the funding sources, Department of Biology at CSUN as well. And with that, I can now say thank you. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those as well. Great job, Jeffrey. That was a really engaging talk. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I wanna steal this, not spotlight, the question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll open it up to other people. So. I, it's kind of two questions. So um, I think a lot about like hyenas in like Africa and how they use like kind of scents and like their bodily waste to kind of segregate and like draw territories and stuff mm -hmm. in um, like uh, in like Southern Africa and stuff. Do armadillos have any sort of like musk or like feces or urine that they're using to partition territories or space? I mean, I, I was thinking that, and then I saw your amazing video of two armadillos using the same tunnel. And I'm thinking like, wait, why didn't the other one smell the other one? Like what's going on there? Yeah, um, yeah so I guess that's my, my first question. Uh, I think that's a good question. I, th I think, I haven't really seen anything in terms of like musk or something like that. Armadillo senses, they don't really have good vision. Uh, they have excellent sense of smell though, um, but I, I don't think there's really anything that's said about like if if the scent is an indicator and the fact that we saw an armadillo I what I think accidentally go into an already occupied burrow leads me to believe that it's probably not scent based in terms of territorial markings and 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 whatnot. The other thing I wanted to do with the research though was was to capture them and tag them and this way you can get a more precise uh, estimate on their actual home ranges. And I think that would help illustrate it more. But in terms of the scent marking, I don't, I'm not sure, but I don't think, I don't think that's a, an indicator or going on. Yeah. And I, I guess my other question is, um, you were talking about seasonality. Um, and my first thought was like, oh, he should work with a botanist to see like what plants are active in like which seasons. And if that has any correlation to like their behavior or their, their certain activities that they're doing. Like if they're, one's mating this time of year, the other one's mating during the other times of year. Does it have to do with some sort of fruiting for some plant or when termites are like at their peak activity or mm -hmm. something like that. But that seems like it'd be like a lot of room for collaboration with other types of tropical uh, biologists, right? Definitely, yeah. And I mean, in terms of the plants and the plant life, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to see differences uh, especially in the underwater, you know, uh, aquatic plant life, because when the, when the floods happen, you know, all sorts of plant life gives rise. So yeah, that's something to, to think of. And it's always important to think of the broader collaboration because yeah, working with a botanist can help illustrate, you know, the, the earthy side of these animals and, and working with entomologists who study insects can help illustrate what's going on in terms of the diet, what they're eating. So yeah, I think there's definitely room for broader collaboration and it leads to more exciting questions. Yeah, thank you. Does it, Robin, did you wanna ask a question? 
Oh yeah, actually my question was kind of the same as your question, Richard. Um, also a very cool project, by the way, Jeffrey, and I Thank enjoyed you. your presentation. I uh -huh. love all the armadillo photos and videos. Um, but yeah, I was, I was kind of thinking about um, them being territorial too and aggressiveness. And I didn't necessarily think of scenting, although um, that is a cool thought, but I was wondering if they, if like it's possible that they're um, exhibiting different activity patterns because they might have like, um, for lack of a better phrase, like face-to-face -face aggression with each other. I don't, I don't know if you know about that. Yeah, that that's also a good question. And it's something I thought of going into it. Maybe, maybe if they shift activity, it's because they don't want direct confrontation and it's possible, but uh, I, I don't know just because I don't have any any data to back it up. The only data I have is armadillos accidentally stumbling <laughs> into the, an occupied burrow. When they leave, it probably means that they don't want to, to be in the same space. Um, in terms of the aggression though, typically armadillos, they're gonna be like, if, it, if you're thinking fight or flight, it's probably flight. They're gonna wanna avoid any sort of confrontation with the exception being uh, the six banded. I know this one's a little bit more aggressive in terms of their behavior. So is the nine banded stumbling and getting into scuffles with the six banded? I don't know, but I guess it is possible just because the six banded can be a little bit more aggressive. But I think, uh, I think it's something else going on. And I think more so it's gonna be temperature. Like I think I don't have the data, but I think if we were to really go back and conduct more research and really get um, ideas on the temperature and physiology of the animals, then I think we would get the, the answer we're looking for, or not the answer we're looking for, but a, a more definitive answer. Okay, thank you. That's very informative. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess just going off of that, I'll, I'll steal the room for another question. How much does the temperature shift from daytime to nighttime? And could, are they like modifying their behavior to um, regulate their temperature? I know like wood rats kind of, kind of for Robin's research and stuff will like modify their behavior because of how they regulate temperature and their diet and stuff and stress. But like, so they they could be doing that too with like ones in the daytime and ones at night. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of how the temperature varies, it can be pretty stark, especially in that dry season. You know, midday can be really hot. And then the evening, I mean, you wouldn't believe it unless you're there, but it gets really cold at night. Um, and yeah, the, the burrows themselves are buffers for these animals because they have low metabolic rates. Like they really rely on burrows as these temperature buffers if it's too hot they can go and cool themselves down inside a burrow if it's too cold they can exit the burrow and go so that's really important in the ecology of not only armadillos but anteaters as well uh, may, maybe going into forest cover or exiting forest cover so that is uh, especially important in the animals the unfortunate thing is i, I don't have any of the data uh, but i wanted to to look at that um, but yeah it is it is very important for, for these animals, definitely. And I think, like I, like I already said, I think if we can look at that, then I think we can really expand on this project. Um, I guess this isn't entirely related to your questions, but um, at the beginning of your presentation, you had mentioned that um, the nine banded uh, armadillo is most widely distributed and it's common in North America, mm -hmm. um, but the six banded armadillo isn't and most of the other species exist in South America. Um, do you happen to know why that might be? Why North, Amer why North America doesn't have as many armadillo species and the maybe like the nine banded is more generalist, which I think you might've mentioned. Yeah, great, great question. And the answer is we, we used to, right? We used to have more xenarthrins. We had giant ground slots and giant, really giant like uh, armadillos and all their cousins during uh, the Pleistocene and Ice Age, but all those guys are extinct. So now we only have the nine banded. So yeah, the question is like, 
maybe that one's more generalized and that's the the truth the nine banded although it is more of a specialist consuming lots of insects in south america the further north you get especially in north america its diet changes so throughout its range its diet changes and it's likely it's more controlled to variable temperature whereas the six banded armadillo and all those other armadillos are they might seem more generalized but i mean it's clearly not the case because they're um, distribution is restricted. So the six man armadillo is only found in like sub Amazon. It doesn't even go into the Amazon tropical forest. So you're only finding it in grasslands and the wetlands of South America. So yeah, there, there are differences in their ecology. And when you look at a specific ecosystem, such as the Pantanal, you, you can see differences and, and their behavior, but the further north you go into North America, it shifts at where the six banded cannot live, the nine banded still finds ways to live. And there's all sorts of other reasons why the nine banded is so successful. Um, but that, that could be an entirely different talk. But the, the main thing you should get out of this is that, yeah, it is in the bigger picture more generalized. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, Jeffrey, in the fossil record, how, how long have the nine banded and the six banded armadillo lived together in this habitat or um is it possible like the nine banded has been making its way like back to certain parts of south america or have they just always and i know the fossil record in south america is really hard to it's hard to keep fossils in the tropical rainforest yeah but... they they have a really really rich fossil record and then like it, it's really detailed um i think they, but you know they originated in south america and then they expanded to north uh, but I mean, and even in terms of their separation, like they go way back. So around, I think it's around 46 million years ago is when we see the first divergence. So the, the last common ancestor they shared was over 45 million years ago. So it, it's really extensive and they go way back. So in terms of what's going on in their activity, it, it can be something completely different just because they diverged so long ago, maybe something 30 million years ago happened that more influenced this sort of behavior. So that's something to, to think of as well. Um, but yeah, that's, unfortunately, that's, that's probably the best I can answer it because I'm not too familiar with all of that, but I do know it, it is very rich and uh, yeah, a lot of things are at play. Okay, well, if um, we don't have any more questions from the audience, um, Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming and giving this fascinating talk. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't know if you wanna add any closing remarks or? No, I'll just, I'll just say thank you for everyone that showed up and listened and to everyone that's gonna tune in afterwards on, on a recording. Thank you so much. I love talking about this research and it's always, it's always fun to be out in the field, but I really get most of my fulfillment in communicating the science to a, a broader audience. So I like armadillos and I hope I can make everyone else like them as well. So thank you all for, for, uh, for joining. All right, everyone, have a good day. Bye everyone.